To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, go to gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. During World War II, the U.S. government faced a problem. Missiles couldn't reliably hit their targets. At the time, it wasn't possible to aim missiles effectively. Then along came a psychologist and a few pigeons. At the time, B.F. Skinner was already using pigeons in his psychological research about behavior. And he was inspired to create a guidance system prototype using pigeon power because of their excellent vision on how easily they maneuvered in the sky. Basically, pigeons would be trained to recognize a target and peck when they saw this target. Three pigeons would then ride in the missile and watch a screen. The idea was that when the pigeons saw the target they'd been trained to recognize, they peck and guide the missile to the target. And then, this wild guided system didn't go beyond testing. It wasn't actually used. But these pecking pigeons do show one thing, the amazing power of learning. Pigeons, like us humans, are able to modify their behavior to do things beyond what they're biologically programmed to do. That's the crux of learning, change. And that means learning changes our lives in ways we're aware of and in ways we aren't, for better or for worse. Hi, I'm Deja Fitzgerald, and this is Study Hall, Intro to Psychology. Most of us tend to think of learning as related to school and memorizing textbook terms. Frantically, probably after procrastinating with a few hours of Netflix and a jug of coffee, am I right? But in psychology, learning refers to any long-term change in behavior, attitude, or knowledge that happens as a result of things like practice, observation, or experience. And it can happen on purpose or not. Think of a big life lesson you've learned. Maybe you failed at something or realized working with others is way better than going it alone. Or a small learning moment. Maybe a photo tagged hashtag cringe made you rethink pairing your flashy new kicks with plaid pants. That's learning too. Psychologists want to understand these types of learning. And thanks to over a century of research studies, psychologists know a lot about it, especially learning related to behavior. Behavior is what people and other animals do, and research has shown that there are three kinds of associative learning, or learning that connects events that can change what we do. Up first, we have classical conditioning. In this kind of learning, the response to a neutral stimulus, or one that doesn't cause any kind of response at first, is changed when it gets linked to an automatic stimulus or response. We can see how this happens with a little help from some furry friends. In the early 20th century, the Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov ran an experiment with dogs. As you might know firsthand, dogs' mouths produce saliva when they smell delicious food, an instinctive reaction. In Pavlov's experiment, food is the unconditioned stimulus, a stimulus that produces an automatic response. That automatic response to the unconditioned stimulus is called the unconditioned response. In this case, the drooling. Whenever the dogs were fed, Pavlov played a sound, which functioned as the neutral stimulus, something that had no effect on the dogs at all. Eventually, he played the sound without any food, and bam, slobber city. So the sound went from being a neutral stimulus to the conditioned stimulus, or a stimulus that elicits a response after training. That response to the conditioned stimulus is called the conditioned response. And in this case, it's drooling again, but now in response to the sound. By linking two stimuli, food and the sound, Pavlov changed the dog's behavior, a perfect example of classical conditioning. Now, think of all the ways that associations have shaped your life. When your alarm goes off, maybe you unconsciously tense up because you've linked this sound with waking up early. And if you've ever tried to make yourself do something unpleasant by pairing it with another thing you already like, that's classical conditioning too. Like if you want to get yourself to enjoy jogging, you might combine it with something you already enjoy, like Mac Miller or J. Cole songs. The music would be the unconditional stimulus and your happy mood would be the unconditioned response. Over time, you might begin to associate these happy emotions with the act of jogging, which is the conditioned stimulus. Soon, you might even grab those sneakers without needing earbuds, and that's the conditioned response. And though classical conditioning can be put to good use, it can also have negative effects. For instance, researchers found that classical conditioning contributes to stereotypes and racism in the United States. A TV news program that associates certain racial groups with crime will, through the power of classical conditioning, teach people to associate racial groups with negative attributes. As a result, we may end up unconsciously viewing people from other racial groups or identities in a negative light, 
particularly if we aren't exposed to them in real life very often. But classical conditioning can be a tool to unlearn racism and prejudice as well. If we connect with different people and different perspectives, we can overcome stereotypes in our minds by learning new associations. We'll talk about how to do that in just a minute. Classical conditioning focuses on involuntary responses, like a dog salivating when they think of a treat, or my mood soothing when I hear Erica Badu. But a big part of being human is making deliberate choices based on what we think the results will be. This is what operant conditioning focuses on, training someone to do or not to do something by reinforcing what consequences they should expect from a given choice. Operant conditioning is a type of learning that changes a behavior by linking good or bad consequences to that behavior. And that's done with reinforcements and punishments. In psychology, a reinforcement is anything that makes a response more likely to be repeated in the future. Getting a bonus at work is one example, and compliments are another. Say good job to a kid when they're done their chores, and they're more likely to do those chores again. Those are examples of positive reinforcement. They involve giving something positive to encourage the behavior, like more money, more behavior. There's also negative reinforcement, which despite the name isn't a bad thing. It just means we're taking away something to make some sort of future response more likely. Like when a parent lets their kids skip their chores if they get all A's in their report card. We also have different schedules of reinforcement. What's your rules about when no reinforcements are applied? For a fixed ratio schedule, a reinforcement is given after a set number of responses. So for example, Imagine a parent giving a crisp $10 bill after a child takes out the garbage five times. A variable ratio schedule is when a reward is given after an average number of responses. This means that you might ring this bell four times and get a sour skittle. Other times you might ring the bell two or three times and get a sour skittle. But if the average was that about every three bell rings you get a sour skittle, then this is a variable ratio schedule. Then we have fixed interval and variable interval schedules. These schedules have to do with the time between the behavior and the reinforcement. For fixed interval schedules, the reinforcement always comes after a certain delay, like always giving a dog your training a treat five seconds after she sits. For a variable interval schedule, the reinforcement comes at unpredictable times, but similar to the variable ratio schedule, there's always an average length of time between the response and reward. You might have experienced these schedules with teachers who wanted to encourage students to study every night. One of your teachers might have used a fixed interval schedule by giving a test every Monday that was based on last week's lesson. Or a teacher might have used a variable interval schedule with every student's worst nightmare, pop quizzes on random days. That actually tends to be effective for learning outcomes even though it's stressful. In addition to reinforcement, operant conditioning can involve punishment. And we think of it as the opposite of reinforcement because in psychology, a punishment is any event that makes a future response less likely. And similarly, we have the positive negative binary here too. Positive punishment is imposing something bad, like an extra chore, or more homework excitements. Negative punishment is taking away something good, like dessert or your holiday bonus. Okay, reinforcements, punishments, schedules. There can be a lot involved in operant conditioning, but it can be summed up by the law of effect, an idea popularized by psychologist Edward Thorndike. Basically, if a person or animal likes the consequences of their actions, they're more likely to perform the actions again. And if they don't like the consequences of their actions, then they're less likely to keep doing them. That's the heart of operant conditioning, making a behavior more likely through satisfaction or less likely through discomfort. Like classical conditioning, operant conditioning changes the response to a stimulus and is a powerful form of learning, and we can put it into action. For instance, if you want to help keep our community tidy, the positive vibes of thanking a neighbor for picking up after their dog could encourage them to keep it up, even when they're tired. But of course, learning is more than operant and classical conditioning. You've no doubt experienced observational learning, which is simply learning by watching others. We do this all the time, both consciously and unconsciously, starting at a very young age. A classic experiment conducted by the psychologist Albert Bandura demonstrates that this type of learning can be incredibly powerful in a scary way. This study showed little children something called a bobo doll, which is a giant inflatable punching doll. No, that's not the scary part unless you've seen it or killer clowns from outer space. The doll pops right back up after being struck down. This experiment involved three groups of preschool children that saw different things. 
adults punching and berating the Bobo doll, adults ignoring the doll, or no doll at all. Then the children were let into a room containing lots of toys, including the Bobo doll. 90% of the children who observed the adults behaving aggressively punched or yelled at the doll. They saw the behavior, then acted it out themselves. So not only do we learn through watching others, but learning can also happen really quickly, especially when we're children. Whether we maintain the learned behavior over time depends on more variables. Nearly half of the aggressive children acted the same way against the Boba doll eight months later. But there's no telling whether or not they would have continued to do so later on without observing the behavior again. Many of our habits likely stem from simple observation of the people who raised us, ranging from behaviors as basic as hygiene and organization to a socially complex expression of anger or gender roles. And though this might explain some of my love of music production and performance, let's take a moment to appreciate how powerful observational learning is. A caregiver simply modeling positive actions consistently over time can have significant impacts on a child's morals, habits, and behaviors. And if we're not careful, the same can go for negative actions. It turns out, learning is a lot more complex than reading a textbook. Many of our attitudes and behaviors are probably the result of classical and operating conditioning by caregivers and teachers. You've also undoubtedly learned a lot by simply observing the people around you. And that's just learning related to behavior. Through learning about learning, we get a better idea of how we've changed and how we can continue to change. We can use conditioning and observation to develop the behaviors that will serve us and the people we care about. And that's learning at its best, when it changes us for the better. If you're enjoying Study Hall, Intro to Psychology, and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, go to gostudyhall.com or click on this button to learn more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.